you ever feel, because you, you cornered a market in Hollywood, didn't you, at one point in your career, of playing, a, of playing a, not evil women, but uh, rather... No, some... they were very, very... I played just as many others. You did? Evil is remembered more. Yes, I suppose. Evil is... Uh, for instance, newspaper people know this. You know, they don't print many good things about people. Mm. There is a, a mad interest in evil in all human beings, I really think. Yes. And a remembrance of it. Well let, me, well, let me put it another way then. In some of those movies, certainly, you played a rather intimidating woman. Oh, I had some marvelous parts, like Little Foxes. Mm. You know, marvelous women to play that were very difficult. When Barbara Stanwyck hesitated to play the femme fatale in Billy Wilder's Double Indemnity, due to her previous successes in playing likable heroines, the director simply asked her, Well, are you a mouse or an actress? Of course, there was never the need to ask this question to Betty Davis, who relished in playing unlikable characters, since Mildred in Of Human Bondage had made her a star. But when she played a villainess, she made it clear that a villainess is not a villainess to herself. She's just someone doing the best she can with whatever she's stuck with. To watch Betty Davis be evil, mean, vicious and nasty was to see villainy at its very best. Betty was always willing to tackle the darker, sinister, maybe even inhuman sides of her characters without judging them or turning them into two-dimensional stereotypes. And audience and critics loved her for it. While her Oscar-winning roles in Dangerous and Jezebel are by no means villains in the traditional sense, their often unintentional desire to cause misery and unhappiness always gets the best of them and both characters do stand out among the suffering wives or suffering mothers that won Oscars during these times. They, of course, are the greatest acting parts. To just always play a heroine. There's really no great challenge to that. But I have played, interestingly enough, almost as many heroines, women like Jock Victory, old acquaintance, very, very many of the other kind of woman. But what is remembered, because that's the way people are, I think. What is remembered, the evil people more. But they were. Foxes, what, what, a, what a play. Of course, Betty was right. We do remember her more strongly for her so-called evil performances than her other characters. However, her most successful years at Warner Brothers show that she was always determined to not rest on one type of role or one type of image, but use her talents for a wide range of styles and genres. Her two most acclaimed anti-heroines of the early 40s in The Letter and The Little Foxes were bookended by two of her most beloved and traditionally sympathetic characters in Duck Victory and Now Voyager. And in 1941, she not only played Regina in The Little Foxes, but also the, quote, good girl in The Great Lie, and gave screwball comedy a try in The Bride Came C.O.D. However, The Bride Came C.O.D., while financially successful, was a disappointment for both critics and Betty herself, and in The Great Lie, she allowed herself to be overshadowed by Mary Astor's Oscar-winning eccentric pianist. My goal was never the marvelous good fortune of, of the public. That was never my goal. My goal was to do the best I could, and I just adored the work. Right. Betty's artistic highlight of the year was therefore, undoubtedly, The Little Foxes which continued her undisputed reign as the artistic queen of Hollywood, combining box office power and critical praise like few others of her era. However, despite this ongoing success, The Little Foxes and The Year in General actually saw some professional setbacks for her. For the first time, she was compared unfavorably to another actress, and her casting, as logical as it may seem, was not greeted with the same enthusiasm as before, and the making of The Little Foxes was also a frustrating and unrewarding experience for her. And on top of that, even the Academy itself became a source of grief for Betty. But what exactly happened? Lillian Hellman's play The Little Foxes opened on Broadway in February 1939. The production was strongly acclaimed for its layered presentation of greed and unhappiness. And no aspect was more acclaimed than the central performance by one Tallulah Bankhead. 
I don't want to go into too much detail here, there is an amazing video by Be Kind Rewind on Tallulah's career, which I highly recommend and link below. But what you need to know is that, despite some attention for her unique screen presence, Hollywood did not really know what to do with Tallulah and she herself also preferred the stage to the screen. But while she regularly received some level of acclaim for her theatre work, everyone was always waiting for her to find the right part that would allow her to truly showcase all her talents. And then came Regina Giddens. There was no doubt that this was the chance she had been waiting for. Her stage performance almost immediately became the stuff of legend and critics could not rate her highly enough, stating that she became one of the theatre's greatest actresses. She fills for the first time a role carved big and fierce enough for her talent. Against the cold, steely force of this year's strongest play, the glitter of her acting lights up a whole era of United States history. The Little Foxes ran for almost a year on Broadway and Tallulah Bankhead would then stay with it on a national tour until April 1941. Therefore still playing Regina when Hollywood began preparations for bringing the play to the screen. The three best plays I've been in actually, which one of the first really fine play I was ever in was in London. I did uh, They Knew What They Wanted, which um, the great Pauline Lord did here. It was a Pulitzer Prize play by the late Sidney Howard and then The Little Foxes by Lillian Hellman and then The Skin of Our Teeth, another Pulitzer Prize play by a divine Thornton Wilder. I think those three were the most satisfying because the plays were so fine. Now the situation can be seen from two points of view. On the one hand you can ask, why would they overlook Tallulah for the movie version? After all, she had received glowing reviews, was strongly associated with the part even outside of the theatre scene and had proven that she could work in front of the camera as well. But on the other hand, recasting plays when they make it to the screen was, and still is, a normal process. Theatre actors often don't have the same level of name recognition as established movie stars. If you want your movie to be a success, you want performers in it that can attract an audience. It therefore only happens occasionally that stage performers are given a chance to recreate their roles when they make it to the big screen. At this point, Tallulah hadn't been in a movie for almost a decade, so there were questions about her star power as a movie actress. Furthermore, producer Sam Goldwyn apparently also thought that Tallulah might turn out to be too difficult. Of course, Betty was not seen as easygoing by producers either, but it seems that she was considered more predictable while Tallulah was seen as a bigger and more unknown risk. And Betty was, after all, at the height of her popularity. Plus she had already proven that these kinds of anti-heroines were exactly her kind of roles. You're gonna see a great show tonight. You're telling me this is gonna be the third time I've seen it. Well, I've seen every picture Betty Davis has made. I wouldn't miss this for anything. So casting her in The Little Foxes must have seemed like the least controversial idea possible. An idea that made even more sense when William Wyler was assigned to direct the movie. Having already worked with Betty on Jezebel and the latter, he also insisted that she was the right choice for Regina. And just mm -hmm. playing heroines uh, was never very fascinating to me. You know, I always was basically a character uh, actress from the beginning. For Betty herself, this was not only a professional but also a personal triumph. Ten years earlier, Sam Goldwyn had dismissed her screen test and refused to sign her for $300 a week. Now, as Betty wrote, he had to borrow her from Warner and he paid me $385,000 to star in The Little Foxes. You should know me well enough by now to know I don't ask for things I don't think I can get. However, while it was a triumph for Betty, Tallulah was obviously not too happy for being passed over. A sentiment made even stronger since her relationship with Betty had already been marked by similar occasions. Tallulah had played Dark Victory on the stage before it became a Betty Davis vehicle and, even though Miriam Hopkins was primarily connected to Jezebel on the stage, Tallulah had also been involved in a play before it became an Oscar winning role for Betty. Betty later recalled this meeting between herself and Tallulah. So anyway, she said, Miss Davis, you've played all the parts I have played. Only I played them so much better. <laughs> and I said, and I said, Miss Bankett, I couldn't agree with you more. She faded out of that house. She was, wasn't going to get any fight from me at all and she was heartbroken. While it's not known that Betty had any qualms about playing Dark Victory or Jezebel on the screen, she agreed with the general sentiment that Tallulah should actually be allowed to recreate her role. 
I begged Goldwyn to let Tallulah play it because she was magnificent in the theater with it. And he wouldn't. And there was a, a resemblance, actually, facially and our kind of hair and all between Tallulah and me. Always was. So that was unfortunate. But as it became clear that Tallulah would not be cast in The Little Foxes, Betty accepted the role and played it with her usual intensity and professionalism. But how she would play it became a source of ongoing conflict on the set. Uh, my round face was very fortunate because I could make it look many, many, many different ways, you know, and, and, and wear many different hairdos. While working on the latter, Betty Davis and director William Wyler famously quarreled over Betty's delivery of a single line. But during the making of The Little Foxes, they argued over her entire characterization, as the shadow of Tallulah Bankhead's stage performance loomed over the whole production. Betty later said, We fought bitterly. I had been forced to see Tallulah Bankhead's performance. It was Willie's intention that I give a different interpretation of the part. I insisted that Tallulah had played it the only way it could be played. Miss Hellman's Regina was written with such definition that it could only be played one way. Our quarrels were endless. However, there are actually different versions of how Betty wanted to play the role versus how William Wyler wanted her to play it. While Betty herself stated that she intended to play the role like Tallulah, Wyler later said that it was actually the opposite. It was the story of this woman who was greedy and high-handed, but a woman of great poise, great charm, great wit. And that's the way Tallulah had played it on the stage. But Betty was playing it like a villain, with no shading. She thought when I tried to correct her, that I was trying to make her imitate Tallulah Bankhead, which I was not. We had terrible disagreements over the way we saw Regina. There is only one person that gets the praise and gets the blame in any film where you are a star. They do not say it's the director's fault, they do not say it's the writer's fault, they do not. So it is self-preservation to be very, very firm about what you do for the outcome. The disagreements between Betty and Wyler became so tense that Betty walked off the set one time and The Little Foxes was also the last time that Betty and William Wyler worked together. She was difficult in the same way that I was difficult. She wanted the best. And to get it, nothing was too much trouble. Sometimes she wanted more takes on a scene than even I did. <laughs> However, despite all the tension on the set, the finished product was cheered by critics who praised the movie as a biting drama, superbly acted and with a faint touch of humanity to soften it, some even calling it superior to the stage version in its expansion of time and space. Lillian Hellman herself later wrote that the movie could have been better and didn't hit hard enough. But on the other hand also later said that the one production that came the closest to what she had intended was William Wyler's film. And about Betty's performance, it became clear that Tallulah Bankhead's shadow not only loomed over the making of The Little Foxes, but also the finished production. Made even more obvious due to the fact that so many other performers who had appeared in The Little Foxes on the stage were allowed to recreate their parts on the screen. The casting of Betty Davis had maybe not created an Audrey Hepburn, Julie Andrews, My Fair Lady-like controversy, but it was an early version of the same story and there was a general sense of disappointment. Many critics were openly tired about Betty always getting the best roles, especially if it meant denying the chance to an actress who for so many had given one of Broadway's great performances. In regards to Betty's fights with William Wyler, it's impossible to say who definitely won this battle and how much of Betty's final performance was influenced by Tallulah's interpretation. But from reading contemporary reviews, it seems that her performance is a mix of Betty's own ideas and Tallulah's role model as comparisons between both actresses were dominant in almost every article, and almost always in favor of Tallulah. Such as, the fact remains that Betty Davis was playing Tallulah Bankhead, whereas on the stage, Tallulah Bankhead was playing Regina Giddens. And another review stated that Betty acted Miss Bankhead's role with what seems just a shade less effectiveness. Other critics focused on the similarity of both performances, stating that Betty unmistakably imitated Tallulah's performance in parts and summed it up as Tallulah is the Betty Davis of the stage and Betty Davis is the Tallulah Bankhead of the screen. And even critics who hadn't seen Tallulah on the stage made it a point to at least describe the part of Regina as Tallulah Bankhead's role. But it would be wrong to say that the disappointment prevented critics from appreciating Betty's performance on its own. 
She was called arresting and vividly hateful, brilliant, extraordinary, free of mannerism, and that she gave one of the best performances of her career. But even then, critics brought back Tallulah Bankhead with remarks such as, if you haven't seen the play, then you will be perfectly satisfied with Betty Davis' characterization. What? We gave a brilliant performance in that show. <laughs> and watch out for us next year. <laughs> And so, it's no surprise that Betty Davis did receive another Oscar nomination for her performance. Her fourth in a row, in fact. But despite this ongoing love affair, 1941 was actually the year when Betty had not only a difficult relationship with William Wyler, but also with the Academy. In January, Betty received word that she had been elected the Academy's first female president. In true Betty Davis fashion, she attacked this position with much more determination than the other heads of the Academy had expected, many of whom most likely only saw Betty's appointment as an honorary position. Betty herself described it as, At the first meeting I presided at as president, I arrived with full knowledge of my rights of office. I had studied the bylaws. It became clear to me that this was a surprise. I was not supposed to preside intelligently. In this meeting, Betty came up with various, as she called it, practical changes. Specifically to abolish voting rights for the extras and, due to the war, changing the location of the Academy from the festive atmosphere of the Biltmore Hotel to a grand theater with Rosalind Russell as the host. Julie, you can't be serious. All ideas that were rigorously rejected by the Academy. Which makes you wonder, how can anybody say no to Rosalind Russell? Betty, sensing that she could not fulfill her role in the way she had wanted to, saw no other way as to resign from her position again. And of course, just a while later, the Academy did implement both of her suggestions, ending voting rights for extras and the Academy dinner as well. Betty herself nonetheless remained proud of her short time as president of the Academy, and her resignation clearly did not hurt her career in any way, nor did it prevent her from adding another nomination to her list of achievements. So, was this nomination deserved? I obviously cannot comment on Tallulah Bankhead's stage performance, how she played the role, and if Betty did follow her lead or try to come up with something new. All that is left to judge is Betty Davis' screen performance as it is. And yes, it's easy to imagine different interpretations for Regina. A softer, kinder woman, who gets trapped into committing her acts by a patriarchal environment that gives her no other chance to do so or a woman slowly developing pride in her ability to outplay those around her by all means necessary. It's one way of doing it and the way I prefer. You should know me well enough to know I don't mind taking the other way. In the hands of Betty Davis, Regina is a different woman. One that is obviously not to be trusted right from the start, constantly scheming and unlikely ever interested in anything else but her own position and advantage. I should think if you knew your money was badly needed, you might just say, I want more, I want a larger share. It is an interpretation that might feel limited at first, but as mentioned before, Betty Davis relished playing so-called evil characters, giving them understandable motives and engaging the audience into their own set of thoughts. The fact that we tend to remember Betty's bad women more than her traditionally likable characters is not simply because evil characters might be more interesting to observe, but because she made them interesting to observe. And this also happened in The Little Foxes, which does present one of the most fascinating performances of her remarkable career. You hate to see anybody live now, don't you? You hate to think I'm going to be alive and have what I want. You would think that was my reason. Yes. Because you're going to die. And you know you're going to die. In the hands of Betty Davis, Regina is a woman clearly on the same level as her brothers and who never hides her true intentions. But this approach works in the context of The Little Foxes as a story about people who hold to the social conventions of pretending, who behave like they are supposed to behave, even if everybody is aware of the actual meaning behind it. And it's Regina's decision to break these conventions, to act and react in ways that are both unexpected and unaccepted, that causes the plot to get out of control. I'm smiling, Ben. I'm smiling because you are perfectly safe while Horace lived to say he lent you the bonds. But Dr. Sloan doesn't think Horace is going to live. And if he doesn't, I want 75% of the business in exchange for the bonds. Betty shows how often Regina reacts impatiently when talks don't go the way they are supposed to go, 
then pleasantries are not enough. And when others don't react the way they should react in her point of view. I suppose they've written you. I can't live very long. I had never understood why people have to talk about this kind of thing. Very well. I assure you, Oscar, I will think about it seriously. What kind of an answer is My that? Oscar, you're in a bad humor. Now leave me alone. It's an approach to the role that walks a thin line between success and feeling misplaced. And Betty Davis succeeded beautifully, creating a woman that feels both familiar and unknown and constantly tries to find new ways and means to get what she wants. I'm sick and tired of hearing about it. I've given my answer and that is all. I think we'll have to talk about it, Horace. Just you and me. But even if Betty's overall performance is unforgettable in its calculation and hidden evil, her relationship with Teresa Wright's Alexandra unfortunately lacks the love that Regina is supposed to feel for her daughter. Again, it does make sense to see Regina as a woman only following her own path and not truly interested in Alexandra, but the script too often makes it clear that Regina does try to protect her daughter and wants to prevent her from leading a similar life as her. Now I give big parties for her and see that she meets the best people and the right young men too. And later on I'll take trips to New York and Paris and have what I want, everything I want. Because of this, the ending also feels a bit too sudden, as Regina's feelings of guilt, remorse and loneliness come without ever having been truly earned. But even in those moments, Betty Davis still shines and her sheer magnetism in the role is enough to overcome any contradictions that might accompany her performance. Alexandra, I've come to the end of my rope. Somewhere there's got to be what I want to. Life goes too fast. You can go where you want, do what you want, think what you want. I'd like to keep you with me, but I won't make you stay. No, I won't make you stay. And so it never feels unbelievable when other characters in the story are surprised by how far Regina is willing to go. There is a change in her, a willingness to break down barriers that stand in her way with more ruthlessness than either her brothers or her husband had deemed possible, giving us some of the most intense scenes and line deliveries of Betty's career. I hope you die. I hope you die soon. Mama, don't! I'll be waiting for you to die. And beyond this ruthlessness, there are touches of a softer side of Regina that come and go suddenly and unexpectedly and help to make her journey utterly captivating. Water? Oh, I'm sorry, I Betty brought Regina to life as a complex character, despite what might initially seem a limited approach. Playing her as both calculating and helpless, and presenting her as a woman the audience can fear, but also feel for, giving Regina her own reasons, occasionally revealing them but also keeping them in the dark, and constantly displaying true emotions as the cause or result of her own actions. Would you like to talk with me, Alexandra? Would you like to sleep in my room tonight. Why, Mama? Are you afraid? So even if Betty was for many back then only the second best choice for Regina, there is no denying that the part feels tailor-made for her, both playing to her strength as an actress while also benefiting from her distinct screen presence. Her work with William Wyler always brought out the best in her. And it certainly would have been interesting to see how he might have influenced other performances she gave in the future. But Regina still stands as a testament to a wonderful off-screen partnership and the unique talents of Betty Davis. And the next nominated performance is...